This is the OTP, presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at fbhp.com. I'm Mike Keith. Very special OTP, as just days ago, Titans head coach Brian Callahan and executive vice president and general manager Rand Carthon and I had a chance to do a Q&A in front of the membership of the Nashville Sports Council. And we did this in the Wesley Mortgage Club at Nissan Stadium. It was a fun 45 minutes overall as the head coach and general manager went back and forth on several topics. And there were some good stories as well. We begin with one that Rand Carthon touched on in a recent press availability. The story of how the Titans ramped up their pursuit of Calvin Ridley. Now, in the press availability, you heard part of the story. The Nashville Sports Council members heard the entire story, and we'll begin right there. Brian Callahan and Rand Carthon from Nissan Stadium on the OTP. So the process started uh, when we set our um, intentions on free agency, um, myself, Callie, uh, Anthony Robinson, Chad Brinker, our coaching staff, Vin Moreno, uh, we went in with a, a target list and uh, we met with uh, Miss Amy and kind of gave her the plan, hey, here are our top guys we're going to target, here are some guys on the back end that are maybes if other scenarios don't, you know, come to fruition. So we're in it, we're getting guys, and uh, we have a day where we ultimately we struck out on two guys that we targeted. And so being a competitor, uh, I, was, I was pissed, you know, and, <laughs> and, and frustrated. Um, so our night ends, and uh, I go in my office, I take a shower, and, you know, I'm in the shower and I'm still pissed, but I'm thinking, you know, about other things. And that's when the thought of, well, maybe, maybe we can get in on this Ridley thing. And so I'm thinking about it, and as I get out of the shower, Chad Brinker's leaving the office, and he's like, you know, all right, homie. And I hear his voice, and I jump out of the shower, I wrap my towel around me, and I just run out, and I stop him. Wait a minute. You went out in the hall. Not in the hall, but in my, in the, like the foyer of my office. Okay. Okay. And so pseudo private. Yeah. But you're in a towel. I'm in a towel. It's not that private. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a towel and I'm like, Chad, can we get this Ridley thing done? And in the media part where I spoke and I could see the cameras now, so I guess it's going to be known. That was why Chad was like, let's talk tomorrow. <laughs> because I'm a grown man standing in front of another grown man and trying to discuss business in a towel. <laughs> And so I was like, all right, cool, but put it on his, on his mind. Uh, I got dressed, and then I went next door and talked to Callie, and we had a conversation about the possibility um, and what Calvin could bring to us and the possibility of adding him. And uh, from there, I had the conversation with Miss Amy, you know, on my drive home about the possibilities, kind of walked her through, you know, where we would need to come in financially. Uh, where our walkaway price would be, um, and told her we'd do more research, um, but let's talk tomorrow. So uh, come in the next morning, talk to Chad. You know, Chad has a really good relationship with Calvin's agent. Um, so Chad started the conversation from his part. Callie and I, we talked again, and we all talked as a group, and it was something that we wanted to keep really intimate. So. During the, during the negotiation of that day, it was only three of us, like, in it. Well, counting Vin, it was four. And we were legitimately just together all day, like, in Callie's office, pretty much how it was. So now we start, we put our name in the hat, and we knew we had to come strong because of other offers and to get him to want to leave Jacksonville. So we do that. We make our initial offer. They tell us it's a competitive offer, it's a good offer, and that they'll explore it. So this whole thing, what do you say, it was about 10, 
10 a.m. Yeah, it was, it was mid-morning. Yeah, so when we made the offer, so I'll fast forward because it's now it's uh, about three. Yeah, it's been hours. We've been going back and forth and sitting together talking. It's just sort of been this whole uh, day just sitting around together waiting and having conversations in between. And there's other things going on too, but that was the main one. We were waiting on all day to see if we can get it finalized and finished. So it's about three o'clock now. This is um, this is the day that you can officially start to talk to guys after 4 p.m. Eastern, which is the start of our new league year. So negotiations are still ongoing. So we get a call from his agent, and his agent says, "All right, you know, I talk to him about it. He likes the opportunity. Not committing, but." We'll say it's about 90%. He still has to talk to his wife and talk to his family. So we're like, cool. So you guys will get to know Coach. Coach doesn't believe it until it's signed, right? Like, I don't want to talk about it. Not one bit. Not until that ink is dry do I believe that anything is done because I've seen it go the other way way too many times. So Coach is behind his desk. I'm sitting on the couch in his office. And it's like, you can't move, you can't do anything, and we're just frozen waiting on this call. So we get a call back and says, his wife likes the opportunity. What we didn't know, his wife is from Huntsville. So it gets her close to her family, and they actually have a home in Huntsville. So it gets them close, so the percentages went up to 98. <laughs> You'll take that, right? 98%, like, all right, we're good. Nope, I just... It, he has to sign. Still no? Yeah, I don't believe anything until it's done. <laughs> so then, because of the type of character Calvin has and, um, you know, everything that he went through, Jacksonville traded for him, and he's like, you know what? Like, these people took a chance on me when others turned their back. I want to be able to call, you know, through his agent, he let us know that he wants to be able to call Jacksonville and say, hey, I'm going to take this other opportunity. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and said, there's no way. This is not 98% done. He's going to call Jacksonville. It's going to go sideways. I, this is not good. I can't believe this is like we're this close. And then I just knew as soon as he called him that it wasn't going to be favorable for us at that point. I was not a very big believer that it would get worked out. And to <laughs> Coach's point, we get a call back maybe, what, 30 minutes later? Yeah. It was like, all right, well, it's – at 50%. <laughs> I knew it. I, I just shaking my head looking at him like, I told you. It was... and, and they're like, you know, Jacksonville wants to put something together. And he was, he's like, you know, we'll see. But they want to put something together to see if they could match. So now we're waiting. So another 45 minutes, we get a call. And they're like, Jacksonville's going to match the offer. Not going to say what we said, but... <laughs> You know, we were in that phase of it. So we're sitting there, and you look at the clock, and it's after four. So I'm like, well, we can talk to him now, right? Because the new league year started. And I'm like, at this point, all we're doing, we're throwing money. And at this point, you're just talking to the agent. Just to the agent. That's all we're allowed to do is have communications with the agent. And so now we're like, we're like we need to get this guy on the phone. Like, I'm sure... The GM's calling them, the head coach, teammates, everybody's calling them from Jacksonville, but we can't. So I'm like, let's get this guy on the phone, let's talk to him. So we get his phone number from his agent, and then we just call and we put it on speakerphone, and by this time, uh, our offensive coordinator, Nick Holtz, had joined us, and Nick coached him in Jacksonville. And so we get him on the phone, and you know, we, we all introduce ourselves, and then we pass the phone to coach, and then coach tells him, you know, hey, this is going to be the system. This is how our program is going to be run. This is how we're going to do things. And, um, and then I got the phone. And it was one of those things, if you guys, I don't know how many people in here are from Florida um, or know about people from Florida, like, we stick together, right, whether you're in state, out of state. Um, and I knew people that coached him, you know, and I knew the area he's from. And so I just approached it from two Florida boys having a conversation, you know, on the phone. And one of the things I told him, I was like, listen, I know where you're from. 
I'm from the same place you're from. I know how you were raised. I know what things mean to you. I was like, but more than anything, we're going to treat you like a man and allow you to be you. I said, whoever that is, you know, and we had done our research, so we knew what he was made of. But we're like, we're going to let you be a man and allow you to be you. And I told him one of the things that Miss Amy takes pride in is, is allowing people to be them and do their jobs. And what do you say? Within two minutes of the phone call, he was like, I'm coming. I'm good. Yeah. <clears throat> we went from a, a 50% chance to Calvin just being like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm coming. And so and then that, wait a minute. Brian, what do you think at this point? I mean, obviously, I don't believe anything. I doesn't. He. Uh, I mean, I felt good. Our, our conversation was good, and and I felt confident that that we had represented ourselves the way that we were we were hoping to, and, and that he would be open to the to coming to, to Nashville. And you know, free agency is like any business. You know, money talks, and and the money part was important, and we were competitive at that point. And now it was about all things being equal, where does he want to play and, and what kind of environment does he want to be in? And I think we did a good job of, of painting the picture of what it's going to be like here for us in, in Tennessee. And um, I think he, he obviously bought into it. So then he says he's coming. So then I say, all right, well, listen, have your agent call Jacksonville and tell him that you're coming. You don't call him <laughs> and, and we're good. And so we were still waiting on final word from his agent. Um, and his agent is one of the best, if not, you know, the best in, uh, in the business. And he called us back. And, of course, he moved the goalpost a little. Well, if you can do this. And at that point, we just wanted it to be over. So we're like, if we do this, are we good? And he's like, yeah. And so we were like, just do it. And he said, you know, hey, congratulations. You just got yourselves, you know, a wide receiver. And so we celebrated. 15, 20 seconds, and then... Yeah, maybe. And then and we get Calvin on the phone, you know, just to, hey, welcome, you know, thank you for believing in us, we believe in you. And, again, I said this before, and I think it got misconstrued a little bit um, because I said, like, again, this is all 90 seconds, and we call Calvin or FaceTime Calvin, you know, as we're having this conversation, and 30 seconds into the conversation, Miss Amy beeps in, and she's like, is this true? You know, and more so, is this true? Like, did we pull this off? Not as in, I don't know what's going on, you know, um, but like, is this true? Did we really make this happen, you know, in this day? And, uh, and at first I was like, like, is what true? I didn't know that it was out. You know, we're in our little bubble, and she's like, it's all over the TV. And we were like... I about drove off the road, by the way. I'm listening to the radio. And so, um, of course, we, we get off the phone with Calvin. We're like, hey, man, we'll call you back. Like, the queen is calling. So, and we talked to her and, you know, just we were all excited, you know, about what we had done and how we did it. It was, it was a collective. It was a group. You know, it wasn't about any one person closing the deal because it took all of us. And, uh, you know, and we closed the deal. We got Calvin back on the phone. Uh, got Coach Tolbert, you know, in and talked to everybody. And then the panic sets in again because you're like, nothing signed. <laughs> so then it's like, well, damn, like, how soon can we get this dude in here? Like, we, like, need to get him in here ASAP signed because, again, like, it's not done in Jacksonville. I, I think it happened a couple of days before. There was a player, Eric Kendricks. Um, he, I, whatever, he visited the 49ers, agreed to sign with the 49ers, and then the next day, I mean, it was all public, he's going to San Francisco, and then the next day he signed with Dallas. Had a change of heart overnight. So then you gotta wait another 24 hours to get this guy in, and you have to live through that. So, long story short, we made it happen, and we're, we're excited to have Calvin. Now that's a story. It's a little little peek behind the curtain of, of how those things go and the ups and downs and backs and forths and it's everybody sees the the announcement that you sign a player but you don't understand how much uh, how much work goes into actually making that happen behind the scenes and like like Rand said the, the collective effort of all the people involved was uh, was really pretty cool to watch and watch everybody do their job and, and activate when it was time to activate and um, you know you get to see the announcement but we take a lot more pride in how the, how the deal got done as opposed to actually getting the deal done. The, the one part I did leave out, 
is after we got it done, I officially quit for the day. <laughs> so I legitimately, after we were done, we were in a good place. I grabbed my stuff. I left and went home. It was like five o'clock. Like I was, I was depleted. I got sick for a few days after that just because it takes so much out of you to get this done. And, you know, you want to deliver a product for the people in this room, the people in this city, the people in this state. And knowing that we were close <laughs> to having it, it just takes a lot out of you. So, you know, we're just glad that it came to fruition. Head coach Brian Callahan, uh, you are an offensive guy. We know that. You have coached some good quarterbacks. You've certainly coached some good receivers. Why was Calvin Ridley worth all of the time and effort? Well, there was an element of explosiveness that, that Calvin brings to an offense. Um, it's been proven he, he was explosive in Atlanta. He was explosive in Jacksonville. Um, teams in the NFL nowadays, you have to be able to, to make those big plays, to make explosive plays, and you have to have the guys that have the ability to do it, and, and Calvin does. Um, he's got great acceleration, great ability to separate. He can win in one-on-one -on -one coverage. Um, there's not many guys in the NFL that can cover him uh, in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, and he's a fantastic person on top of it. And so you add that element to an offense that already has got some good young players, uh, we felt like that was something that would be able to take us uh, another notch up, up the rung offensively. And, and as, as everybody that follows the NFL knows, I mean, the, you got to score points in the NFL to, to win football games. And so we needed someone that could help us do that. And, and Calvin fit that perfectly. What can he do in combination with DeAndre Hopkins scheme-wise? Well, it's hard to cover both of them. You know, it's um, – DeAndre's obviously been uh, a very productive player over his entire career. Um, he's big. He's strong. He's a matchup problem. Um, he, he's been – an explosive player as well over his career. And so uh, to be able to have two receivers that, that are hard for people to match up with and have to determine which corner they want to put on which player, um, and both are different styles of players. So we feel like no matter who we go line up against, um, that we're going to have someone that can go win. What can those two guys do for Traylon Burke's development potentially? Well, you get, to be, you get a chance to see, for a young player like him, you get a chance to see what another two other veteran, productive veteran receivers look like, how they work, how they approach their, their craft, how they approach their work day, uh, how they take care of themselves, how they prepare for a game. Um, and then there's, a, there's an element of playing receiver in the NFL that's confidence-based. And, and these guys have an incredible amount of self-confidence. Um, it's almost delusional the way that they, f they feel about how well they can do their jobs. And that's how you have to be. Uh, to go out there every Sunday and, and, and play in front of all these people and, and produce. So to have a young player see that from two veteran players, I think, is, uh, is an important part of, of any player's development at, at all positions, truthfully. Uh, but, but those two guys, I think, will really give him an example to follow. Our Nashville Sports Council crowd here likes stories, and they know that we got a good cornerback this week, and that's an understatement in Legereus Sneed from Kansas City. I guess it's more story time with Rand Carthon. Um, That's so be my new podcast. Yes, you're, you're, story time with Uncle Rand. Um, so Kansas City puts the franchise tag on him, meaning they owe him, I think it was $19.8 million this season. He has the ability to go out and potentially make a trade, and then last Friday you officially acquired him. That was almost a month from the date that the tag was applied until you officially acquired him. When did you start working on this with him in Kansas City and whomever else? And, and how long did it actually take in terms of the process day to day? Well, I'll say um, active conversations where um, compensation was discussed with Kansas City was more like two weeks. Um, so it wasn't that long. Um, you know, we had other conversations, uh, more just us inquiring about where they were um, with their process and where they were with him. Um, and you do the research and you know, kind of understand where other teams may be, what other teams may be interested. And so, uh, again, leaning on relationships and understanding like who we are as a, a collective group. Um, I had a good relationship with his agent. 
um, Chad uh, and Mike Borgonzi, uh, who is the assistant GM in Kansas City, um, they have a really strong relationship. So allowing those two, you know, to talk amongst themselves from a team to team standpoint and with us having Kansas City's permission to uh, engage in conversations with the agent, uh, kind of just had an ongoing conversation with the agent, no offers or anything, just kind of learning a little bit more and, and uh, more, uh, more than anything doing a case study to try to see where they want to be, you know, what's important to them contractually. And so, um, you know, as time went, you kind of, we, we, we approach most things with our walkaway price, right? Where we're, where we're ultimately where we're, we're done. And so we kind of knew where we wouldn't go uh, within a trade and um, amongst myself, Callie, uh, Miss Amy and the rest of the team, like, hey, this is where we'd be comfortable, you know, making that move. And so um, we got to a point with Kansas City where it was like, okay, you know, this is what we're willing to do and they accept it. And so then it transitions from there to now you have to negotiate a deal with the agent. Um, and then that's where Vin Marino, you know, comes in and kind of based off of my conversations with the agent of where they want to be um, and what was feasible for us at the time, uh, we were able to find that happy medium. And so again, it, it the process seemed like it, it drug out because so much was coming out, you know, in the media and all those different things, but it was a really a two week process. And, and then on the back end of it, it was more logistical because we were getting ready to leave to go to owners meetings, as was the team with Kansas City and the way you have to execute from a franchise player being, you know, tagged, traded and signed. It's our contract, but it has to be executed by Kansas City because a player has to be under contract in order to be traded. Correct, and the player has to agree to be in traded. And so there were some, you know, some red tape for all sides, us in Kansas City as well. And again, logistically, we're in Orlando, Kansas City's in Orlando, Legarius is in Dallas. And so getting him to sign, you know, in person, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Kansas City had to fly, you know, one of their young scouts to Dallas to meet with him to get him to sign the proper paperwork, you know, in order for the trade to become executed. So uh, it was more of a logistical thing, but it over the course of two weeks. So two weeks, Brian, I wonder, your defensive coordinator, Denard Wilson, your secondary coach, Chris Harris, the guy who works with him in the secondary, a guy we know well in Steve Jackson, are they driving you crazy at this point to get this done? No, we we um, we we did a really good job, I think, as a as a as a staff of of identifying the players that fit what we were looking for um, from a from a player perspective, from a coaching perspective, and I thought we had a really tight free agency initial plan, and so we knew corner was a spot that we were hoping to address. We knew there was some free agents uh, that would be available. Um, we would have, you know, at the onset. The idea that we could sign Legarius was uh, obviously our top target, but then he gets franchised, and now it's a tag and trade situation, which makes it very different than just a normal free agency contract negotiation. And so we kind of put him on the shelf. We signed Cheeto, um, who, who I, I love Cheeto. He's, he'll be a fantastic addition. But we knew that there was an ability to, to get maybe two quality corners in the free agency process and really solidify that position. Um, and, and obviously we knew those were needs for us. And so Denard was uh, obviously uh, very excited that we were gonna take that route for him and, and try to find two really good players. And we felt like that was the best allocation of our resources um, for those positions because that's the way the NFL works. And, and they were very much included in the process. You know, obviously the way we do things, our scouts um, watch players as, as well as our coaches. Um, but when the, the first thought of potentially trading for uh, LJ came up, uh, myself, Callie, Anthony Robinson, uh, Denard, Chris, Steve, we all went into a room together and we just watched him play. We just turned on the tape and we watched him and we literally talked about, hey, are you guys comfortable if we trade this for him? Now understand this will cost you this. And so we worked through all of those scenarios with the coaches. Um, so they will understand, you know, everything that goes into getting this player um, because it's not always an apples for apples thing. And so um, they were very understanding of where we had to be and what it, you know, 
the, the areas that it would take us out of if we pulled this off and made it happen. But I promise you, those guys were more than happy. We would say so. Because, I mean, Cheeto Awuzi and Legereus Sneed and Roger McCray, for that matter, don't those guys totally fit what Denard Wilson wants his guys in the secondary to do? Yeah, if you watch those guys play both both Cheeto and, and Legereus and the way that Roger plays the nickel position, um, it is a tough, physical, smart group of, of, of corners. And, you know, you, you see all the clips of, of Legereus when he's, you know, taking Tyreek Hill and, and jamming him into the ground in, the, in the, that late game of the year. And Cheeto plays very similar style. They're both big players. They're, they're, their dimensions are big. They're tall. They're long. Um, and they play a style that's very physical, which not every corner plays that way. And we feel like we got three of them um, that fit that style. And that's certainly one of the things that Denard stressed when he got here is that that ability for the corner to challenge um, and play physical at the line of scrimmage and make not make life hard for, for NFL offenses. And as an offensive coach myself, I've played against Legereus. I've watched Cheeto in practice for four years. Um, and Legereus is one of the toughest corners that, that we've had to face when I was in Cincinnati. And so to, to add him and add Cheeto really transforms, I think, both the mentality uh, and the physical nature of our secondary uh, on defense. All right, so let me ask you, the Titans gave up a third-round pick to get LeJerry Sneed. Last year, you gave up a third-round pick to get Will Levis. Brian, how has Will Levis already made his presence felt in this offseason within Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park? Just his, his eagerness to, to get started and improve. Obviously, we have rules about when and where we can actually meet with players on, on actual football. Um, but Will's been around. He's been present. Um, he's taken a couple trips out to California to work with some of the quarterback people that are out there who are really good. Um, but we've had chances to have some discussions. I've talked to him on the phone a bunch. I keep him in the loop uh, of everything that's going on as far as where we're signing, who's been targeted, um, I kept him in the loop in the coaching staff as we hired guys, and I think that uh, quarterbacks need to feel that um, it's not an ownership necessarily, but it's just an involvement in the process because ultimately he, he's the extension of me on the field. You know, he's the guy out there playing on offense, and, and that's where you want your quarterback to be. So to be involved in the process, to have communication with him, uh, his willingness to engage in that communication, uh, and finally his his leadership role and, and talking to all the players that we've signed and making sure that he's the one that's, you know, making a phone call from the player side, welcoming them to the, to the team has um, been really impressive. And so we start Monday, and, and I can't wait to, to get actually in a meeting room and talk football and, and coach uh, finally after all this other stuff you got to do. But um, he's been fantastic, and I can't wait to get to work. It's really exciting, and that the work that he's put in uh, on his own has been really impressive. Rand, who have been some of the other guys who have really made their presence felt that you feel like are going to step up and take more of a leadership role in 2024? Well, we've had a ton of guys, and I think uh, Brian said it um, when, like your first week here, we've had a high number of players just in the building every day working out on their own, um, and that, that's been the cool thing, and that's one of the blessings about being in Nashville, that guys want to be here. Um, all offseason guys come here whether you play a year or you play 20 years most guys come here and make Nashville their home so that's one of our advantages so we have a ton of guys around um, but one guy I'll name is um, Tajay you know Tajay is a guy that he's he's been around um, he cares a lot um, I didn't know this you know prior to us signing but he and Tony Pollard have had a relationship that um, I don't even know how exactly they know each other, but I know Tony reached out to Tajay before he got drafted to kind of offer him advice, and they kind of just kept in touch throughout this time. And so, you know, when we brought these guys in the building for the first time, Tajay was one of the guys in, you know, making sure that he's around, he's meeting everybody and meeting their families. And so um, you started to see his leadership, you know, develop you know, as time went on for him last year. And so, um, especially with Derek no longer being here, there's a, a void, you know, particularly um, in that room that I know he's willing to um, step up and become the guy in that room. The one other guy that was the first phone call I made when I got the job was Jeffrey Simmons. Uh, to me, Jeffrey is, is who the Tennessee Titans are. Um, he's, to me, the face of, of what our organization is. And so I think that 
he's continuing his role. That's what he's been here, but um, Jeffrey's been great, and he's, he's been around as well. And so having that, he's sort of like the Will Levis of the defense. And my, we've tried to keep in touch and uh, make sure Jeffrey was sort of aware of what we were doing and how we were doing it, because uh, he's, he's a guy, too, that's, that's a, you know, he is the Tennessee Titans. When I, when I think of Tennessee, I think of him, um, because that's the one I had to go game plan against. So, <laughs> uh. Why did you start offensive line construction with center Lloyd Cushenberry from the Denver Broncos, getting him to commit as quickly as possible? Well, I think it, um, it starts with another fellow, by the, also by the last name of Callahan. I call him Big Coach. Having Big Coach, you know, a part of it being uh, the best in the game at uh, coaching O-line, um, guys want to be here. You know, guys want the opportunity to uh, play for him. He's gotten a lot of people paid, you know, and so, um, you know, we had, again, we talk about relationships and being relational. Um, big coach over the last few years coached uh, Ethan Posick, which was his center in Cleveland. And Posick and Cushenberry, they train together. They're both LSU guys. They train together in the offseason. And so they had plenty of time to talk about what plan for Bill Callahan can do for your, your career and do for you as a player. And so uh, we identified him very early in the process as, uh, you know, the best center uh, in free agency and a young and ascending player who has a ton of, ton and ton of great ball, you know, left ahead of him. And so um, as a staff, we identified, you know, him as, as a top target. Our coaching staff agreed. And, you know, at that point, I mean, we didn't ask Ethan Posick to do anything, but, you know, when it, when it starts coming down and we're having these conversations during um, the tampering period with his agent, of course the agent communicates, you know, hey, you know, Tennessee called, and then now those phone calls start from the players, and then you get guys that you look up to stamping, you know, the coach, it makes it, makes it easy for us. Your dad is an unbelievable evaluator. I've wondered how much of the current offensive line room can he evaluate on tape and how much more will he need to see as you get on the field in the weeks to come to fully know them? Yeah, I mean, he, he's evaluated every player on the roster. He watched every snap they all played. Um, he's watched practice reps of some of the guys that didn't play a lot. Uh, so he's very aware of, of what we have currently on the roster, what we needed moving forward, uh, where, our, where our deficiencies were, where we might have some strengths. Um, so, yeah, he's evaluated the whole thing from top to bottom. He's, uh, there's nobody better, uh, and obviously I'm biased, but there's nobody better uh, out there when it comes to both evaluating and coaching. And so, um, you know, we, we, made a, we made the move at center because center was, is a, is, that's the middle of your offensive line. It's the, that's the guy that where everything goes through the balls. He touches the ball every play. Uh, there's, there's the communication aspect. And if you're good in the middle of your offensive line, uh, in the interior, you're going to have a chance to be a pretty good unit. So that was sort of a key starting point for, for the offensive line. And uh, he was adamant that that was the guy that we target because that's the one where you, as you build out, you know, you're, you're building from inside out. Um, and those guys, you need a center. And his ability to know exactly what he wants and how he wants it done is what makes him unique. And um, he can't wait to get on the grass and, and get to know these guys a little further and actually coach. Uh, but we got a pretty good feel for, for where we're at and, and where we need to head. How much of a help is that to you and the rest of the personnel staff, Rand, that you can walk down the hall and you've got somebody that he says, this guy, yes. And you, you can just be like, this guy, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, it, maybe you don't take him because he doesn't fit the spot and you have other needs, but the, the stamp of approval is realistically all you need if you want to go in that direction. I think it's, it's, um, it's an advantage for us as scouts. And I think it's, you know, not only big coach, it's all of our coaching staffs. The, the number one thing when um, we were talking with Callie during the interview process was being able to have a plan, not only have a plan, but being able to articulate that plan and create the vision for what we need to do as a personnel department. And both of our backgrounds, um, you know, we have experience with what we call profile tapes. Uh, which are basically, you know, highlights, if you will, of what you're looking for at every single position and being able to describe those attributes. Um, and so we had a big meeting, uh, one with the offense, one with the defense, about what we're looking for at every single position from a uh, skill 
um, factor um, and critical factor. And so for us as scouts now, we have a visual, because these tapes were put together by the coaches, we have a visual as a reference point to always be able to go back to and, and to know what, uh, what's required to play in our scheme. So it makes it really, really easy for us to know that although player A is a great player, he's just not a fit for what we do. And that player B or C may be better options because they fit exactly our scheme. And so it makes our job so much easier. Okay, we got to wrap up. Seems like we've been going for five minutes. But I told you we could go for three hours. I've got so much more. But they obviously have to get back to work. The draft is approaching. Do you guys look at mock drafts, either one of you? I think there's, a, there's an element of, of mock drafts that you have an awareness of because it, people are collecting information from all different parts of the league, from scouts, from coaches. You know, some of these people have good relationships around the league, and so you, they do get accurate information sometimes, um, but never like one. It's usually an aggregate of all the mocks, so you just get an idea of where – publicly maybe guys are, I guess, being mocked to. What's your chances would be for a guy, for example, if you have, uh, if you're picking at 38, what are the chances that X player is there? Well, and, and publicly in all the mocks, it's, you know, it's like a 10% chance that they make it to 38. So there's, there's some things that do go into the mocks. I do not pay attention to what they say. It's just more about an aggregate of what the public perception is of, of players and teams, there is some accurate information in there sometimes. I bet Rand loves them. I love and hate them uh, <laughs> at the same time because it keeps me up at night. Um, part of one of the things um, that Sarah Bailey, who runs our research and development department, uh, one of the number one things I asked of her when she was hired was to uh, create a draft predictor model. And it's kind of what he was talking about in knowing, showing us, being, uh, and it's based on our grades, the coaches' grades, mocks, and a bunch of different, you know, variables, analytic variables, um, and it gives us a percentage um, of the chances that these certain players will be there at each one of our picks. And so we were talking about it this morning, um, actually, and um, what goes into her model is there's over 400 mock drafts that are out there. Really? Yeah, there are over 400. Some could be my next door neighbor putting one online. Don't know, but there are 400 available mock drafts or over 400 available mock drafts um, that kind of go into our algorithm. Um, so yeah, I pay attention, unfortunately. Um, but like Coach said, you know the reputable ones, um, the ones that have good relationships that might be tapped in. Right now, um, we're 20, what's today? the fourth 21 days we're 21 days away so three weeks away from the draft um they'll get better you know next week a little bit more accurate next week and probably the week of the draft is time to just turn off everything because that's that's when the misinformation period starts and so you don't want to get too caught in the you go from the legal tampering period to the lying period don't you it's all lies <laughs> <laughs> all right we're going to wrap up with this you gentlemen have been working together for Two and a half months, roughly. And I'll start with you, Brian. In the two and a half months, what are you most excited to have gotten accomplished with Rand Carthon and with everybody else in the Titans organization? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, there's not been much time uh, for reflection uh, yet, unfortunately. Um, it just seems like every day there's just something else coming that we have to keep moving forward on. So I haven't had much chance to, to reflect on, on the early part of this. It's been just every day something's coming. Um, but what I am the most excited about and the most proud of so far, I think, is, is the way that we've worked uh, together in the processes. In the, you know, we went from Rand and I working hand in hand trying to get our staff hired um, getting the, the strength coaches hired, the people that were involved in that process, starting the free agency process, getting the draft done. There's just, it's been a really, really seamless um, starting point to now where everybody just does, works, works in their role and does their job and we all work together and it's, that part's been really enjoyable and I think that that's what attracted me here in the first place and to see that in action every day is really what's uh, made that, you know, this is, 
the fact that I got to come here and they offered me a job, but my decision to come here as well was that this is what I thought it would be. And I think that that's uh, probably the highest compliment I can pay to the people in the building right now is that it's, it's exactly what um, I expected it to be. And I think that that uh, bodes well for, for what's to come. Um, and I think that that's, to me, the most important part is, is the way that everything's been worked together on and, and collaborated on and, and everyone's pushed forward with the same vision. That's been um, pretty outstanding to, to see in action. Yeah, it's, it's the same for me. It's the relationship um, that's been developed not only between Callie and I, but just our staffs, you know, merging together. And, you know, you're, you're in the building um, and you, you're up and down the hallways and doing your thing. And, but, you know, I, I think everybody that comes into the building feels, you know, our building. They feel uh, we were just talking yesterday and we were like, man, because we've been having a bunch of uh, draftees come in for what we call 30 visits because uh, you're allowed to bring in 30 players. And we kind of jokingly said to each other that if this was college recruiting, you know, we'd be Alabama or Georgia. You know, we'd, we'd get our – Tennessee, you mean. <laughs> Notice I didn't say Florida. but <laughs> That was nice how you did that. You almost got it right. Sorry. Um, but I think, and I think that's a testament to – uh, not only who we are as people, um, but our, our coaching staff and our personnel staff. So to, to fully answer the question, the thing I've been most proud of is the great people, you know, that we've brought in. And that's something that we care about a lot. You know, it's a prerequisite to be a good coach, to be a good personnel person, and to be a good football player to be here. Um, but we care about the people. Uh, we're not going to sacrifice uh, that. We're not going to sacrifice our building, our locker room, because these people have to be stewards of the community and stewards of the organization and the state. So I'll just – these two gentlemen mentioned that they have the 30 visits, and there are – how many in today? There are a bunch in today. Uh, three. Yep. So you've got to get back, and so I'm going to let them go. And as we let them go, I think the thing that I have been most excited about and the people in this audience have been most excited, excited about – is the fact that we have had so much to be excited about in the last two and a half months. There have been a lot of fun days. We didn't even play the game yet. Um, so Titans fans are fired up. Thank you both for making this happen. Thank you for taking the time for the Nashville Sports Council and for our great fans. Brian Callahan, Rand Carthon. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you. Thank you so us. much. Appreciate it. SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any other event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. Thanking the Nashville Sports Council for allowing us to share this with you, I'm Mike Keith. We appreciate you joining us for the OTP.